Amen. If you have your Bibles, open up to 2 Samuel chapter 15. 2 Samuel chapter 15. We'll be looking at the whole chapter this morning. Woody uh, read to us verses 1 through 12. I'm going to read verses 24 through 29, but like I said, we will be looking at the whole uh, chapter here today. As you're uh, opening, I, I guess I'm just feeling all overwhelmed with gratitude to the Lord. I'll, I'd like to just say one more word about Disciple Now, and uh, thank you to Cole for all the hard work he's put into this, but also uh, all of our volunteers here. But also remember, this was a countywide effort, and so uh, Missy Parker at the EBA put a whole lot of work and effort into this, as did our friends over at Meadowbrook for hosting uh, this Disciple Now. So if you think of it, you see anybody from that those staffs or those folks, be sure to say thanks to them as well for all the extra work they've done to help make this a great weekend for our, uh, for our students. So thank you guys. Thank you all for attending. We, we are thankful for you. 2 Samuel chapter 15, verses 24 through 29. Uh, if you have your Bibles open, why don't you go and stand with me out of reverence for the reading of the words of our God. The verses I'm reading are on page 267 in your pew Bible, if you want to grab one of those, if you don't have a Bible. The author of Samuel writes under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit in such a way that as the words on this page are being read, God Himself is speaking to us. Beginning in verse 24, And Abiathar came up, and behold, Zadok came also with all the Levites, bearing the Ark of the Covenant of God. And they set down the ark of God until the people had all passed out of the city. And then the king said to Zadok, Carry the ark of God back into the city. If I find favor in the eyes of the Lord, he will bring me back and let me see both it and his dwelling place. But if he says, I have no pleasure in you, behold, here I am. Let him do to me what seems good to him. And the king also said to Zadok the priest, Are you not a seer? Go back to the city in peace with your two sons, Ahimaaz, your son, and Jonathan, the son of Abiathar. See, I will wait at the fords of the wilderness until word comes from you to inform me. So Zadok and Abiathar carried the ark of God back to Jerusalem, and they remained there. Let's pray together. Oh God, we thank you so much for Jesus Christ. We thank you for his gospel, and God, what an opportunity and pleasure and joy it is to gather together with your people today. Oh God, I pray that we would be brought into your presence this morning. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. It was one o'clock in the morning, and I was absolutely on the verge of a panic attack. Uh, worried, uh, sick. And so I looked at my wife, Whitney, and I said, we've messed up. We have really messed up. This was a decision we made. And it was a horrible decision. We messed up. I said, it's always going to be like this. I, I, I'm so worried. It's never going to change. This is going to be like forever. I said, I'm 37 years old. I can't do this. I'm not capable of this. I don't have the strength for it. What were we thinking? But the whining and the crying and the barking and the howling wouldn't stop. About this time last year, I was literally on the verge of a panic attack because our new puppy, Althea, would not shut up. (laughs) I thought she would never sleep through the night. And I thought, here it is. This is my life now. I went and paid money for this privilege. (laughs) Traveled, picked this dog up, brought it into my home. It's going to require more bills later. I know that's coming too. And guess what I get for it? No sleep. No sleep. Well, as you can guess, the Lord heard my cries, and the dog now sleeps. Uh, she occasionally requires the sacrifice of a toy or a shoe or something to chew on uh, to stay asleep, but she sleeps through the night. Here's the reality it's very difficult to believe for the future when the present is a mess. And let me, let me also say this never make a decision at one in the morning. I'll also add that. It just That's a freebie. That's not in the Bible, but just something to consider. Um, I would just encourage you in that. It's very difficult to believe for the future when the present is a mess. Now, it, you're rightfully, at least I know, 
all the people who are the primary caretakers of dogs in the room, my wife included, you're all rightfully rolling your eyes at me right now. You're like, you get over it, you drama queen. What? You just, it's fine. You missed a couple nights sleep. Everything's going to be okay. But in the moment, it's hard to think that way, isn't it? Especially in the middle of the night, you're starting to panic just a little bit. It's silly to panic, like, justifiably, I understand. It's silly to panic like that over a puppy. But in this situation, in this text that we've read today, David finds himself in a very serious situation. Now, I don't know if it was one in the morning when he wrote about it, but he did write about it in the third psalm. Uh, later today, you might read the third psalm that talks about the uh, verses that we're going to read today in the next couple of chapters as well, where David reflects on these realities. And he says in the third psalm, O Lord, verse 1, how many are my foes? Many are rising against me. Many are saying of my soul, there is no salvation for him in God. Now think about this for a moment. It's one thing to have a dog howling in the night. It's another thing altogether. For people to say there's no salvation for him. For David to be robbed of the one defining characteristic of his life, that he loved God and God loved him, that God set him apart according to his plan and purpose. How do we trust God when our world is crashing down around us? Now, there's no question that's what it looks like for David here, right? Many are rising up against him. It's got to be so hard to spend so many years in the wilderness, so many years waiting on the kingship of Israel, and then finally to have all the hearts of the people unite around your kingship, and then you feel like finally you've done a good day's work, and then through the sin you brought into your own house, all that God has given to you seems to begin to unravel. This is exactly what the prophet Nathan told David would happen. It's the word of the Lord. It's judgment against David. Evil will rise up against you out of your own house. Nathan tells him after his sin with Bathsheba and against her husband Uriah the Hittite. is a reminder here then of God's sovereignty and frankly God's hatred of sin. How do we trust God? Not just when our world is crashing down around us, but how do we trust God when it feels like the whole world is crashing down around us? I have conversation after conversation, and I am so troubled to see how marked our lives are by fear of the future. We're worried. Everyone's worried. The polls show it. My experience seems to back that up. We're worried about the future. We're fearful. This text is meant to show us, I think the author originally designed it to show us, by the power of the Holy Spirit, he was inspired to show us David's faith in those difficult circumstances. Perhaps you wonder sometimes, what set David apart from Saul, who was rejected from the kingship? The author shows over and over again, even on the other side of sin, the way David's response of repentance, the way David's responses of faith show him to be a man after God's own heart. That is, David had received God's grace, and he responds to it appropriately. He repents, he trust the Lord. He follows the world even in awful challenging circumstances. Circumstances that weren't his fault. Now, of course, circumstances that are his fault. I'll tell you, you may not need it today, but the day will come when you need faith in challenging circumstances. And this morning, I want to show you four ways to cultivate faith in challenging circumstances. Circumstances. How do we trust God in the midst of trials and tribulations and other times that test our faith? I want to show you four ways, four points. I think it will help you grow in faith and especially faith when you need it the most, when trials come. Here's the first point this morning. Follow Christ, not flash. Follow Christ, not flash. Now you've already decided you don't want anything flashy you're listening to a guy in a bow tie preach this morning. So you already have decided about that. That doesn't necessarily mean you're following Christ, right? Follow Christ, not flash. I'm sure many of you remember Absalom. Absalom, David's son. He's a dashing man. He 
uh, is riding a chariot around Israel now, a chariot with horses. This seems to be a pretty new technology in Israel. You might remember earlier in the text, there were some battles where people had chariots and uh, the, there was a lot of fear in Israel over the presence of chariots. And so I guess uh, Absalom has acquired for himself one of these chariots and is now a man about town. He's got the chariot with the rims on it. I bet he's got the uh, 10 inch speakers in the back. He's riding around Israel with his long, beautiful locks flowing. And on top of all that, he has an entourage around him, 50 people to go out before him. He's making a scene. He's making a show. Look at Absalom. He recently returned from exile over the murder of a, one of his half-brothers. Um, we won't get into all of it, but it's some real housewives kind of stuff going on in the royal court. Here, here's the reality. Despite their seeming reconciliation at the end of chapter 14, Absalom is still not fully reconciled to the king. When he came home from exile, he was still getting the cold shoulder from David. And despite that last verse where David gives him a kiss, seeming to indicate the reconciliation. This chapter shows us that Absalom still doesn't feel fully accepted in the royal court. And so he chooses to take matters into his own hands. He's got his chariot, he's got his horses, he's got his entourage of 50 people, and that's how he gets around town, showing off how glorious, how flashy Absalom is. On top of that, not only is he riding around town trying to look cool, Trying to steal the hearts of the people. On top of all that, he decides to start hanging around the gate. And he does this so he can intercept anyone who comes to receive the king's judgment. We've seen a picture of this happen in the previous chapter where a wise woman from Tekoa is sent to David to adjudicate a situation between her two sons. Now, it turns out to be a ruse, but it shows us that David is regularly receiving people from the kingdom in order to administer his wisdom to them. That practice continues later in the reign of Solomon. And Solomon gains such a reputation for his wisdom that people start to come from outside Israel to bask in the wisdom of Solomon, to re receive the wisdom of Solomon. All that being said, we know that David is receiving people along in this way. So Absalom shrewdly stays outside the gate and intercepts anyone who comes along. And they come and he says, tell me what's going on. What, what brings you here? And they say, well, so-and-so, you know, borrowed my donkey and it died and now he won't pay me back for it or whatever else issues may come and I'm coming to the king to deal with it. And he says, man, that's terrible. Wouldn't it be wonderful if the king had someone, I don't know, maybe a guy who had five pounds of hair hanging off his head. Wouldn't it be wonderful if he had someone to hear you? I mean, you sure are waiting a long time here. You want to take a spin in the chariot and uh, go ride around town for a second? We can talk about your issues. It'd be wonderful if the king had somebody to hear you, wouldn't it? Wouldn't it be nice if he was doing a little better job up there? Yeah, I think so too. He wouldn't stop there. He, he, he would keep going. Notice in verses uh, 14, I mean verses 4 and 5. Then Absalom would say, oh, that I were judge in the land. Big surprise there, right? Oh, that I were judge in the land, that every man with a dispute or cause might come to me, and I would give him justice. And whenever a man came near to pay homage to him, he would put out his hand and take hold of him and kiss him. Thus Absalom did to all of Israel who came to the king for judgment. So Absalom stole the hearts of the men of Israel. David had kissed Absalom to welcome, welcome him back to the kingdom. And now Absalom is kissing all of Israel to woo them into his kingdom. He stole the hearts of the men of Israel. And all of this is to an end. Oh, that I were a judge. Oh, that I were king. It's not just something Absalom says. It's a plan. After four years of usurping the king. Now listen, there's a little textual variant there. So if you have a translation that says 40 years, just know there are two traditions out there of long-standing translations. And one says four years. These are old Hebrew manuscripts. And one says 40. And so translators have to make a choice there. And it feels like most likely that this happened for four years. It makes most sense in the context. 
four years of this go by. Four years of this go by, of him usurping the king. And then finally, Absalom springs his plan into action. And he has himself declared king at Hebron under the guise of keeping a vow to the Lord. That is, he had told the Lord, if I ever come back to Jerusalem, I'll go worship you. And he tells his dad that's what he's doing. And his dad lets him go and he brings 200 unwitting conspirators with him. They didn't know what they were doing, but he brought them with him to further disguise what he's doing. This is well thought out, well planned out. Planned out. And you can see what Absalom is doing. He goes from uh, a classic demagogue, a person who simply appeals to whatever everyone says is best. He appeals not to what is best, to what, but to the felt needs of the people. You know, anyone, I think we need to remember this. This is just a, maybe a piece of practical advice we can pick up from the Bible. It's one of God's great graces. There's just so much practical, so many practical things in the Bible we can learn from. Let me just remind you of this. Anyone can stand around and say they'd do it better. Right? Anybody can stand around. Anybody can be a Monday morning quarterback. Any, anybody can do that. Anyone without the actual challenge of leadership can tell everyone they're right, can tell everyone what they would do differently. Anyone who doesn't actually have to lead people can tell everybody how they'd do it differently. Because until you actually have to do it, you don't really know what you would do. And the easiest thing in the world to promise is results. But it's the hardest thing in the world to deliver, isn't it? And so, so long as the only thing you have on the docket for the day is riding around, brush your hair, show everybody the chariot. When your job is chariot, all you really have to do is stand around and tell everybody how if your job was king, you could do it better. He's a classic demagogue. And then, in so doing, he makes himself out to be better than the king and everyone believes it. But what all these people who join in Absalom's rebellion, who participate in this coup, and they, they do, they join him in droves. What they have missed, and what Absalom especially has missed is this. God has already appointed his king. God has said nothing about taking David from the throne. God has not appointed Absalom as the king. He has made David king already, and it's for purposes bigger than just the throne of Israel. It's for purposes bigger than whatever grievance or frustration the people of Israel happened to have that day. It's for something bigger than how long you have to wait in line to be heard by the king, how long the criminal justice system is taking. It's for a purpose that's bigger than the convenience that everyone needs to feels like they need to experience. And it's for a purpose that's bigger than what things look like. Doesn't it seem like Israel should have already learned their lesson about kings that look great? Saul was head and shoulders above everyone. But here they're being drug in by flashiness again. The flash and charm of Absalom is dragging people away from not just the kingship of David, but ultimately God's purpose in putting David on the throne, which is to bring his Christ into the world. People aren't just leaving David. People aren't just trying to get a new king. People are forsaking the God who wants to save them through his Messiah they're doing and friends we must remember that we have to follow christ and not flash we follow christ not flash we can always find something or someone that seems better than jesus we can always find something or someone whether it be religious whether it be secular we can always find something or someone that seems better than what god has given to us in his gospel but even when it seems like things are going better somewhere else even when it seems like there's a flashier opportunity somewhere else, we follow Christ. Don't be drug away from Jesus. There's nothing better than Jesus. Second of all, not only do we follow Christ, not flash. Second of all, we follow Christ, not comfort. We follow Christ, not comfort. Now, I love to be comfortable. Um, I don't, for example, want to be interrupted at night when I'm trying to sleep. There's a, I've already told you that. You already know what kind of comfort I like. But here we see David and his servants, when they hear of 
the coup, when they hear what sort of army and force Absalom has amassed, they realize they have to leave Jerusalem. And I want you guys to get a sense of how sad this is, how horrifying this is that God's appointed king would leave God's appointed capital city. And yet, he does. Look at verses 14 and 15. Arise and let us flee, or else there will be no escape for us from Absalom. Go quickly, lest he overtake us quickly and bring down ruin on us and strike the city with the edge of the sword. And so all of David's servants come with him. They leave the comfort of Jerusalem and they go back to a wilderness exile where David has been before. It seems like all the promises of God are being stripped from him, doesn't it? But as they leave, all the servants are passing before David. This sort of royal retinue is going before him. And in so doing, David speaks to Ittai the Gittite. He's not an Israelite. He's new to town. And David tells him in verses 19 through 21, you go back to Jerusalem. You're new here. You're not an Israelite. Uh, Things will go better for you if you stay in the comfort of Jerusalem. But notice what Ittai says back. Verse 21. He answered the king, as the Lord lives and as my Lord the king lives, wherever my Lord the king shall be, whether for death or for life, there also will your servant be. Do you see what David's servants, what even Ittai the Gittite, this Gentile is seeing that Absalom and the usurpers can't see? That it's worth following the king and thus following God's plan, even if it means the total loss of comfort. Even if it means danger, even if it means leaving the comfort of the city and going out into the wilderness. Whatever you see is right, the servants tell David. I will follow you, Ittai, the Gittite says, despite being given the opportunity to remain in Jerusalem. And I think there's something for all of us as Christians to remember here today. There are things that are worse than discomfort in this life. There are things that are worse than even being miserable. It is worth following Christ even when it means following Him outside of comfort. And there will be some of you right now who are challenged by faithfulness to Jesus. And you say, if I keep being faithful to Christ, it's going to make me miserable. Oh, my friends. Oh, my friends. You will never find joy in sin though there may be joy on the other side of misery, so long as your joy is in Christ. But I promise you, my friends, a temporary happiness without Jesus is an eternity of misery without Jesus. But a temporary discomfort with Jesus is infinite, eternal joy in and through and with Christ. Follow Christ, not comfort. Brothers and sisters over here, young people, there may be days where it seems awful to follow Jesus, to do the right thing. I promise you from experience, both positive and negative, I can tell you there is nothing that would drag you away from Jesus that is dragging you toward toward joy. There's nothing. There's nothing. Third of all, not only do we follow Christ and not flesh, not only do we follow Christ and not Comfort, third of all, we follow Christ, not self. Christ, not self. Abiathar and Zadok are priests, and they, along with the other Levite priests, bring the Ark of the Covenant of God to David as he leaves Jerusalem. And I want you to see what happens in verses 25 and 26. The king said to Zadok, carry the Ark of God back into the city. If I find favor in the eyes of the Lord, He will bring me back and let me see both it and His dwelling place. But if He says, I have no pleasure in you, behold, here I am. Let Him do to me what seems good to Him. Now, how easy would it have been to David to decide to just take the ark with him? I'm God's king, therefore God's presence is coming with me. How easy would it have been for David to say, you know what? If I take this ark with me, I bet God will protect me. It wouldn't be the first time an Israelite thought that, would it, would it be? 
It may have slipped out of your memory because it's been so long since we were in 1 Samuel, but that's precisely one of the things that happened early in 1 Samuel. They were afraid of a battle, and so they brought the ark of God out, and, and God refuses to be treated like a rabbit's foot as a good luck charm, and God allowed them to get uh, annihilated in battle, and the ark of God was stolen. How easy would it have been for David here to see God as the God of David? God's primarily about David and about keeping David on the throne and not letting David get embarrassed or making sure David doesn't have egg on his face or teaching that fancy boy in his chariot a lesson, that God. It would have been so easy. If you don't have the king, you don't get God either. But no, what does David say? That if the Lord's displeased in me, if the Lord's displeased in me, let him do with me what he wants. But if he's not, we'll be back. God can take care of himself and God can take care of me whether the Ark of the Covenant is here or not. God doesn't have to follow David out of Jerusalem. God's God's at work in David's kingship and it's more about the kingdom than it is about the king. Because, of course, God is the one who's truly king. But God doesn't serve David. David serves God. And faith means trusting God's promises even when they don't seem possible. Faith means leaving the ark in Jerusalem and leaving your fate to the Lord and trusting Him and recognizing that something bigger is happening. Something Absalom missed, something the conspirators missed, something Saul missed, but something that David gets, something the author is trying to help us see that David is a man after God's own heart despite his sin. And as God strips away Every single external blessing that's associated with the kingship of Israel, David still believes that God keeps his promises and that he will establish through him a line that will last forever. Follow Christ, not flash. Follow Christ, not comfort. Follow Christ, not self. And finally, follow Christ, not fatalism. Follow Christ, not fatalism. As the chapter concludes, you might be thinking, well, when David says, leave it there and God's going to do what God's going to do. Back in verse 26, you might say, is he kind of becoming a little bit of a fatalist? Is he not even going to try to keep the kingdom? I mean, is he not going to try to hang on to the promises of God? It might seem that way, but David's actions show us otherwise. And I want us to know this. We believe in God's sovereignty. We believe God has a plan and a purpose, but we are not fatalists. We don't believe that we have no role to play in the work of God. Now, God can work without us, but God is pleased to use us. And so we ought to be people of action. That's what David does here. He recognizes that submitting to the will of God and trusting the will of God does not necessitate being inactive. David was not one of these let go and let God uh, theologians. As he's ascending the Mount of Olives in verses 30 through 37, David is weeping and crying. And to add insult to injury, he learns that one of his key advisors, one of his key counselors, Ahithophel, has joined the conspiracy. He's on the run again, he's outside the city. And he's taken another horrible blow, recognizing that Absalom's conspiracy not only has brute force, but it also has intellectual power. It's got wisdom on its side. And so David does what he can only do at this moment, and he prays to God, Oh God, would you turn the counsel of Ahithophel into foolishness? Almost immediately in the text, a gentleman named Hushai shows up. His clothes are torn, he's got ashes on him, he's clearly mourning what's happened. And David recognizes he's coming with him. And so what does he do? He sends Hushai to Absalom to thwart the counsel of Ahithophel. That is, he's commissioning Hushai to be a double agent on his behalf. And and so he uses the priests that he's told to wait back to give him information. He's going to use the priests as his information superhighway. Hushai will report to them and they'll report to David. Now... You can see here, what's going on? Well, God's going to do what God's going to do, right? Of course. But at the same time, David's making a plan according to the plan and purpose of God that's been revealed to him to get back to Jerusalem, to go do what God's called him to do. And those two things are not 
exclusive. They're not mutually exclusive. We can walk and chew gum at the same time. We can trust God, trust that God's in control, trust that God saves sinners, trust that the Lord attends to the preaching of His Word, and at the same time, we can get after it for the Lord Jesus Christ. We can follow Christ no matter what. And if you find yourself in challenging trials, I don't want you to sit back and ask yourself why in the world God's doing this and, and mope and complain. Instead, get busy in service for the Lord. Trust God. Cling to His promises. Trusting God doesn't mean that we can't take action, brothers and sisters. Trusting God, faith, means that we take action according to the purpose and plan and will of God that's been revealed in His Word. That's what David's doing. He's taking action. We follow Christ, not fatalism. I see this question today. Will you trust God even if your world is falling apart? Will you have faith in God? Will you remember that He's on His throne? Would you trust the Lord even when your world is falling apart? I hope you can say what David said. Psalm 3 opens, as I've already read to you, O Lord, how many are my foes. Many are rising against me. Many are saying of my soul, there is no salvation for him in God. Selah. And you read this passage and you say, Sounds about right. It sounds about right. I don't want to saddle up. If this is the promises of God, don't count me in. But the psalm doesn't stop there. David says this, But you, O Lord, Psalm 3, are a shield about me. My glory. My glory and the lifter of my head. I cried aloud to the Lord And he answered me from his holy hill. David is exiled from the holy hill of God. David is leaving Jerusalem. Everything seems to be in shambles. But God has not left. The king may no longer be on the throne. A usurper may be on his way to Jerusalem. But the king remains on the throne. It's Him that answers. It's Him that is David's shield. It's Him that is David's glory. It's Him that lifts David's spirits. It's Him to whom we can cry. It's Him who will answer His people always, even when things are bad, even when trials come, even when our world is falling apart. Brothers and sisters, put your faith in Christ. Follow Christ. He will hear. He will answer. He is your shield. He is your glory. No matter what, my friends, put your faith in Jesus. I want to offer an invitation this morning. If you've never done that for the first time, if you want to be saved, oh, my friend, it's possible. You can be saved from your sins. You can be saved from an eternity of punishment suffering the wrath of God for sin. You could be saved because Jesus took the punishment for you. I believe with all my heart, if you will turn from your sins in repentance and turn to God in faith through Jesus, you will be saved. If you need someone to talk to, oh, I'm here for you, but you can do business with the Lord right where you are. After this prayer, I want to invite you to do business with the Lord. Second of all, you may be a Christian. You may say, Pastor, I just need some time to do business with the Lord. Symbolically, if you want to come to put those things before Him at the altar, you can. If you need someone to chat with, that's what I'm here for. Or you can do business right where you are with the Lord Jesus Christ. He's everywhere. He's waiting for you. And finally, if you're looking for a church home, you want to talk to me today about what it means to be a member here at First Baptist Church. After this prayer, while the song is playing, I want to invite you to come.